This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the only one platform to build your online presence. If Twitter wrote a movie with all its overused memes, tired jokes, stupid logic, and cliched versions of men, women, and race, it would be Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, a film for the Twitter generation who hate original characters and have a five minute concentration span. So we're just supposed to let people die. Because you realize how messed up that sounds, right? Uh, let me guess. He died. But before you carry on, I was a big fan of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I thought that was a great film. Stylistically, it looked great. The story was good. Came up with an interesting way of creating a new version of Spider-Man without totally shitting on the original version, which is something a lot of us wish Hollywood would practice more often. Miles was his own interesting character, and not just a bastardized version of Peter Parker. The villains were more than paper-thin bad guys who had interesting motivations and backstories. The father was alive, which is rare to begin with these days. He wasn't a moron, and he loved his son. You gotta say I love you back. Dad, are you serious? You wanna hear I me love say? you, Dad. And he acted like a man. In fact, all the men in the first film acted like men. I know, what am I? Some sort of backward caveman for wanting to see men portrayed as men in film? Well, yes, maybe. Or maybe I'm just normal. Even the multiverse storyline worked. And I normally hate multiverse stories. They seem like the lazy modern cop-out that allows franchises to cash in on emotional deaths of characters that they can then just bring back at any time with the ease of the multiverse. I'm listening. <laughs> The bloody multiverse has replaced time travels as my most hated way lazy writers get themselves out of holes they've dug themselves into. I figured it out. Time travel. Wow. That's amazing and bullshit, bullshit. The multiverse Spider-Mans, women's, they's, whatever they go by, were an interesting idea. Though them all being from different animation universes, adds a lot of problems to the already complex idea of multiverses. Like when does it stop being a multiverse and just become a different universe that's existing at the same time, with every possible thing being different except for the fact that somehow they got a Spider-Man. You see, multiverses usually means they are multiple versions of the same universe, with the experiences all mixed up, so we get different outcomes. The multiverse in these films isn't just about multiple versions of each character, it's also about multiple versions of evolution, biology, science and God. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Talking Pig. My name is Peter Parker. But I get it, and I went along with it. This is an animated movie aimed at kids, but I thought it was going to sit in its own universe. What are you? Some kind of silly cartoon? You got a problem with cartoons? Is it great storytelling, fitting for one of the most loved superheroes of all time? No, it's a movie-length joke that's tipping its hat to the history of the animated heroes in a huge wink to the audience. Like Shrek, you know, stupid but fun. But everything that made the original film great is gone, even the lead, because this is now Gwen Stacy's story. Well, it's at least her coming out story. We open with her struggles and we end with her redemption. She gets the first and last lines of the movie. Let's do things differently this time. Never found the right band to join. So I started my own. The art style from the original is now in overdrive. What was used to great effect in the first film is now a distraction hiding the true meaning of this film. And most of all, the greatest crime of this film, no Nicolas Cage. Wherever I go, the wind follows. And no f***ing third act. I nearly cried when I realised that this was part one of a two-part story. Well, I didn't really cry because I can only take so much social grooming and classic character destruction in my entertainment. I'll be fine missing the next one, thanks. It was antagonising fascists. It's a metaphor for capitalism. And the change I hated the most was the dialogue. But this is where the British stole all of our stuff. Where the original felt genuine and sincere. It felt like real people talking with some very sweet moments. I love you. <laughs> Wait, what? Well, that's been replaced with a script that's injected with what we see all too often in modern Hollywood. None of your Shut business, up. nosy. Especially when trying to write strong teenage girls. Way too much smarmy smart ass. I'm sorry, who exactly are you supposed to be? I'm from another dimension. You are? And as far as the humour, man, could we get a joke from this decade, thanks. Well, I don't think I want this costume anymore. Being a paid writer used to mean that you would write new things, like jokes. But every joke in Across the Spider-Verse is copied from people on Twitter who share jokes they think are new that were really being shared by their dads back in 1998. The M stands for machine. Yes, the old, and I mean very old, ATM observation. What's the next film going to have? Pin number jokes? I love Chai T. What did you just say? Chai D Chai means D, oh, bro. Oh. And yes, language is used differently in different parts of the world. Chai T is what it's known in the West. That's a Western culture cliche. Now let me guess, you're going to ask me about saffron and cardamom and non-bread, which is the same as saying bread, bread, which is the same as saying Chai D. 
It's a bit hypocritical to lecture your audience on cliches when the character doing the lecturing is all cliche. Speed a few street dogs, quick break for a cup of chai with my mind. This is where the traffic is, this is where the traffic is, this is also where the traffic is, there's traffic here too, but this is where the British stole all of our stuff. It really feels like this film is written by the same people that write those incredibly cheap, horrible kids shows. The type of writing that thinks that references alone are humour. Now then, take more selfies. Yes, I love to selfie. <laughs> In the very long opening of this film, our hero Spider-Woman is fighting a sepia-toned villain from another dimension when our main antagonist gets introduced, a big, cool-looking, powerful Spider-Man. Instead of being surprised or at a minimum polite, Gwen decides to be a complete smart-ass to this guy because, you know, he's a dude. And that's how women talk to men who are masculine in movies these days. Wow, actually, I'm not confused. I know, Peter was prone to the odd smart-ass line. Guess you haven't heard. I'm the sheriff around these parts. But that was usually reserved for the villains, not fellow crime fighters. Cat, Captain, big fan of Spider-Man. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. Just... Hey, everyone. Good job. Okay, knock yourself out. Well, why are you saying it like that? You're not funny! But Gwen's attitude and basic politeness quickly changes when a Spider-Woman turns up, an Afro-wearing motorbike-riding kick-ass Spider-Woman. One who, on top of all that, is also pregnant. Not only can a woman do anything, they can also do it pregnant. Now, this isn't from personal experience, but riding a motorbike pregnant is not the most comfortable or easiest thing to do, let alone kicking ass and swinging through the multi-dimensions. But, you know, every woman's got to be as womanly as we can womanly make them. Will you adopt me? She goes from laughing at the dude to asking to be adopted by the woman in the blink of an eye. And the only reasoning is that one of them doesn't have a schlong. How modern and interesting. And don't get me wrong, this is not about some weird reverse sexism. It's the laziness of the writers is what I hate. Make your characters interesting, not just easy cliches. Cause I'm Foxy Cleopatra, and I'm a whole lot of women. So hot. Will you adopt me? And while every woman in this film is a maze balls. What? Call for back. Come on. Please just call for Yeah, I already called her. The men, well, the men. They aren't really portrayed so well. As a father of a daughter and the son of a mother. Yeah, actually, stop talking. Okay, duly noted. Well, I'll accept this guy, Spider Punk. He's the only one that comes across as manly and not a psychopath. Here we go. Hoping you're not helping. Good. I mean, with the over coolness of Spider Punk and his tough, rebellious ways. Hey, what of it? I'm surprised he didn't try and fight the system himself. But like most punks in the real world, his toughness is all show and no substance. Instead of him fighting against the Spider Man norm, he waits for a kid to turn up and then encourages him to rebel and take all the risks. Kid, look Stop at calling me that. Here we go. Hoping you're not helping. Good. And then when the shit does go down, old Spider Punk decides to save his own skin first. For the record, I quit. <laughs> he only returns when there's safety in numbers. Ah, the modern heroes, nothing like them. Hoping you're not helping. Good. But the others, shit. We have moron, pathetic, flamboyant, psycho, and female. Hi, Peter Parker. The loving father from the first movie who didn't seem overly stupid. Well, I wouldn't say he's now a complete moron, but boy, is he struggling in the school meeting. They're studying dark matter. Yeah, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> and following help. a simple conversation seems to completely throw him. You created me. Wait a minute, what did you create that guy? I did. Anyway, back to our leader, who for some reason, absolutely no one in this film respects. All for yeah, I already called her. Ah! But I enjoyed that. A psycho man-child who is part genius, part moron, and who is constantly raging with teenage outbursts that include calling this Spider-Man a little nerd. I'm gonna get him started on Doctor Strange, a little nerd back on Earth 199999. <laughs> what a bitch this guy is. While we're on this scene, how come distance and sound have no connection in this film? Anyone can just talk to anyone else at any given time, no matter how far apart they are or how noisy their environment is. Are you sure you're even Spider-Man? I understand giving leeway to an animation over a live action, like in scenes when they are swinging around together, and it'd be impossible to hear each other, but who cares? Don't worry, I really would have come to see you sooner. Right. Boom! Who cares? But some scenes are just really lazy storytelling. Stop running! Then stop chasing me! Like Super Duper Spider-Man talking to the pilot of a helicopter that's not only miles away, but would be super noisy. How does that work? I'm a good guy! Shut up. Yes, yes, I know. It's a fucking cartoon. But, you know, like I said, there's leeway for animation and then there's just bloody lazy writing where you can't be bothered setting up the scene properly. What is Hollywood's fascination with fat pilots these days? Let me buy you a drink. 
then we have the Valley Girl Spider Man and his amazing hair. Do almost nothing with my amazing hair. You don't use any product at all. Just coconut oil for hair, some genetics. Ah, oh, yes, guys are always having these type of conversations about their hair and which hair products they use. I used to dye my hair all the time. Then we have this mess of a human. That was a particularly harrowing memory. One of the few white dude Spider-Mans who was always way too emotional about everything. In fact, he's that emotional he can't get anything done. Yet somehow he too got an important time travel watch. <laughs> Before you get your knickers in a knot, I couldn't care less if you made the old cast non-white. The whiteys have had a pretty good run at being Spider-Man. But if you are gonna mix it up a bit, try not to be so bloody obvious about your bias. At least have one competent white guy. As a father of a daughter and the son of a mother. Yeah, actually stop talking. Okay, duly noted. I mean, look at the difference here. Look at the black dude. Cool as fuck. Give me a film on that guy. And then we have Peter, an estrogen filled whitey wearing a pink bathrobe holding a baby. Yeah, there's no agenda in this film at all. You're the reason I had her, okay? <laughs> that should make Peter's partner feel real special. Peter Parker's whole personality in this film is just female. He wears a pink dressing gown the whole time. We even find out he wears that to work. How's work? Uh, He's now a baby on board, demasculated, cockless male who just wants people to hold his baby. Do you want to hold my baby? What? Would you just give the baby one squeeze? Oh. It's very rejuvenating. He even needs his wife to explain to him what a sports metaphor is. That's a sports metaphor, by the I way. I understand. Oh, you're just such a nerd in high school. I have watched sports. <laughs> So, you know, that's what they've made of Peter Parker. Now a short break from the madness to talk about something that'll make you look awesome. Do you have an amazing product you want to sell? Maybe it's you and your talents you want to sell. Well, with the Squarespace website, you can sell absolutely anything to the world. And with Squarespace, it's not just about looking good, it's also about making your life easier and growing your ideas. That's why Squarespace keep adding fantastic new features like Fluid Engine, the next generation website design system that brings the ease and freedom of drag and drop designing. So now you can let your imagination go wild. They've added custom merch. Want to sell custom merch to your fans? Well, with Squarespace, all you have to do is design your product and Squarespace will take care of production, inventory and shipping. You just collect the cash. I'm rich, bitch! And one of their newest time-saving features is video collections. Easily organize your video library and showcase your content right on your website. You can upload a video or just copy in your video URL and you're done. You can even set up a members area where you can monetize your content right on your own website. No other website builder can give you all of that. Go to squarespace.com slash robothead and try Squarespace for free. And then when you are ready to blast off, use the code robothead and you will get 10% off your first purchase. See the link below. Squarespace. I'm rich, bitch! I uh, love you all. Now, the plot of this movie wouldn't seem so bad if this was an alternative universe out on its own, not connected to any other Spider-Man. But no, like every bullshit IP these days, every story, film, TV, show, fuck, in this movie, even the video game versions have to be linked. Video game guy. I love video games. Another video game guy. Are you talking to me? As I've mentioned, we allow certain liberties in animation that don't quite work in live action. It's rude to stand. I caught that one myself. I slipped. You? Okay, I did all the work. But if you're going to make a film that crosses those lines, like in the Lego movie, humans affecting the animation world brings up far less of a logical leap than having the animated world ruling over the live action world. They are the canon. Chapters that are a part of every spider story, every time. A boy's daydream toy world coming to life is sweet because it's something kids dream of every day. The creators saying that the Lego world, the animated memes, and every live action tragedy are all linked and are now all governed by this animated world is way too much meta circle jerking for my taste. The way I'm using it makes it an adult thing. And don't for one second think you're ever going to get away from Spider-Man's origin story. No, these days no stories are allowed to move forward. We're going to be reliving Uncle Ben's death to the end of time. If you think that's bad, well, treading the same ground over and over would be bad enough, but no, we have to raise the stakes on repeating these deaths in the Spider-Man universe because a loved one's death is no longer a sad random act that makes our newly created web slinger grow into the hero they should be. No, those deaths are now lifted to a high purpose and have to happen because talking about those deaths forever is easier than creating a new story. All those deaths are now important because now they're all pre-written canon. And you know, canon confirmation is super important if you're on Twitter. Because in the real world, 
no one gives a shit if something is labelled as canon. And if you don't know, canon is the studio or creators greet upon events that happen in any IP's universe. Bullshit, bullshit. Yes, I prefer good stories and original ideas, but to the true diehard fans, canon means everything. Protect me. So if you preferred it when Spider-Man was your friendly neighbourhood hero, over the universe crushing godlike heroes and villains we're getting these days, well, you're completely out of luck. Spider-Man in this film isn't just godlike, he now is a god. And not in some over-the-top way of describing his powers. Powers, I might add, that constantly change to fit in with the limited imagination of the writers. Spider-Men's, women's, and whatever else they want to make a Spider-Man. In this film, are gods in the classical sense. The fate of every universe relies on their actions. If they save the wrong person, then their whole universe can collapse. What's that? It's a metaphor for capitalism. Woke! Woke! My favourite thing about Valley Girl Spider-Man is that he pretends to respect the father of his crush, knowing that the guy is marked for death in a couple of days. Police Inspector Singh, this is your daughter. I do not know her. That's why Valley Girl Spider-Man's so cheery all the time. Once the police captain dies in the planned canon death, our young hero here will be free to bang away his girlfriend at his heart's content. Inspector Singh's death was a canon event. You weren't supposed to save him. That's why Gwen tried to stop you. Every single man, woman and child across the planet will die if Spider-Man dare strays out of the pre-written story and saves the wrong person. <laughs> Which means the spider things, well, they are fucking just things now because even a car's one. The spider things are gods, but they're low-level gods because for this story to work, there has to be an all-powerful controlling god that is writing the script that has to be followed. And if this god's script isn't followed, then death to millions of men, women and children. Ah, I love a happy hero story. <laughs> our god cannot exist in this multiverse. Free will doesn't exist. Even god in our world lets us try and cure cancer or maybe save someone from dying but not the spider god the spider god rules all and if one of his chosen ones steps slightly out of line we all die for the sin of non-sacrifice so pray the right people get killed you are the reason i'm alive jesus i just love you everyone on the planet is the supporting cast of spider-man and his existence you have a choice between saving one person and saving an entire world every world is every death rescue or capture part of the canon or is it just one death for each universe over the full history of that universe save my dad call an ambulance someone call an ambulance Uncle ben. Uncle ben. Oh. The famous spider bite that started the Spider-Man story is now no random coincidence. That bite was pre-written by Spider-God. So at a certain time in man's existence, a particular death can happen to save mankind. You have a choice between saving one person and saving an entire world, every world. I've heard a similar story somewhere before. The one man must die to save mankind. The police captains in the Spider-Man story are now Jesus. And Spider-Man now has to be Judas. See, not so bad, watch him up. And if Peter Parker was your all-time favourite hero, think again. He is part of the Spider Police Force, whose main mission is to make sure the right people die. All the Spider heroes are in on it. All the ones we've been joking around with are in on this Death Guaranteed Club. Not one of them is working on a plan to stop the death rule. I mean, the setup to guarantee the right people die is amazing. Oh God. It's actually surprising that in the time between films they worked out the whole canon system and understood it. It's where the lines converge, they are the canon. Chapters that are a part of every spider story, every time. I mean, you think it would take generations to work out that pattern. Linking a whole universe's collapse back to one individual not dying on a certain day? That's some Stephen Hawkins thinking. Wrong again. But our main antagonist here figured out controlled universe skipping travel. Well, his sidekick did. Oh, here we go. The multiverse didn't collapse. Oh, cool. Uh, hey, did you finish the goober? It's not a goober, it's a gizmo. Deciphered the whole mystery of the canon universe killing rules and set up a huge strike force within a couple of years of the events of the first movie. Even had time to have a full backstory where he lost his family, found a planet that had an exact copy family, and replaced his doppelganger when he died. You think that backstory alone would have taken a couple of years? Bullshit, bullshit. But who knows? Hopefully, time in this film is like an interstellar and moves differently the further you are away from home. I want to see Miles return 
return home. And his mum is now 93 and his dad is long dead as decades have passed while he's been away. But if that's not the case, how did this guy get so much done in just a few years? And to be totally fair, the universe skipping tech must be incredibly easy to make. Spider-Punk just starts making his own version. It sort of makes that big spider weaving webs to send people through time all look a bit over the top, like it's not really needed at all. You know? Oh yeah, Peter knew. Peter Parker is as weak as the pink dressing gown he lives in. Every Spider-Man that's ever existed is weak compared to Miles. He's the bestest Spider-Man ever. My bicep to constrict you. Why is he not only stronger, but also morally superior to every other Spider-Man that's ever existed? Even better than the original creation. We know it's hard. But it's the truth, Miles. Because that's what Hollywood does. It turns original characters into losers, so their new improved version can be so much better. Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. Across the Spider-Verse makes Peter Parker an absolute ballless dropkick, who only gets to help in the end because Gwen Stacy comes to get him. And he's dumb enough to take his baby. You break enough cannon and save enough captains and we could lose everything. Wouldn't all the spider men, women and things jumping universes be massive cannon breaks? Or is this evil spider god only concerned with two specific deaths? What about your dad? He's a captain, right? Because I quit. That means... You are made of stupid. This huge setup, thousands of spider brains working together to protect the all important cannon while people die. And Gwen's dad just saves himself by resigning from his job. <laughs> Oh man, not one of these amazing spider people, cats, dinosaurs, cars, or even our genius antagonist thought of that. <laughs> Just quit your job. Idiots. Woke! Woke! Party. Allegories are interesting in movies, aren't they? The idea of criticising the world or getting a message across without being too literal or blatant is a fascinating way to be creative. Star Wars was an allegory for the Vietnam War, gravity about childbirth, the Truman Show about reality TV obsession, and how real people are dehumanised by consumer audiences. So yes, some are very obvious, but some people just don't see allegories in stories. Their brains aren't wired that way. George R.R. R. Martin has said that Game of Thrones is an allegory for climate change, but some people will never see that, they just see it as an entertaining story. And allegories work especially well with children. They don't catch on to the underlying meaning, but they can be directed to a certain way of thinking. Now, if you were writing a kid's movie and wanted to talk about certain issues, well, you could just put up a big-ass sign in your film that's blatantly put directly with the old go and make sure it's up long enough for the kiddies to read. But if you really want to dig down and get into those little kids' inner thoughts, you'd make a huge part of your film focusing on what it means to be accepted for who you truly are, especially when it comes to parents. I know you know I've been lying to you. It's because I thought if you knew, you wouldn't love me the same. Spider-Man was always protective of his identity to protect his loved ones and himself. But now it's more about whether their families will still love them once they expose who they really are. I don't think Peter Parker was ever questioning his family's love. What do you want to tell me? You gotta promise nothing's gonna change. Papa, I will always love you. You gotta promise. But this film wants to really drill home that your parents need to accept your true self, no questions asked. Even if that means quitting your day job. And if they don't support you 100%, then go off and live with people who will accept you for who you are. Yes, so f*** you, Dad. Till I find the Spider-Woman. Even Dad's rocking the flag badge at work. Yes, this film's a huge allegory for coming out. And just in case you were missing that. And they can only know half of who I am. The filmmakers lean heavily on a certain flag's colour palette to make sure the kitty's subconscious is connecting those dots. Woke! Woke! Oh, and if you think the colour palette that was chosen for these scenes is just a coincidence, then I've got some lovely bridges I'd like to sell you. Bow! Who cares? And I'm not the only one that was sitting in the cinema reading this message loud and clear. The members of a certain group have been very excited about the message the movie was sending. Where my people at? Where my people at? Now what do we have here? Oh boy, that's going to go down well. <laughs> Selling trash to the public has never been hard. Don't worry, I know where there's more. McDonald's. Chicken McNuggets are fun. So after really enjoying Into the Spider-Verse, to say I was disappointed in this movie is a bloody understatement. I hated this movie. It's obnoxious, way too long. It pushes its agenda way too hard, which is a shame because a lot of these characters could have been great. A lot of the animation looked fantastic and the voice actors did a great job. They're all just stuck in this stupid woke piece of crap. Where you can all stand around and each other off while you tilt your head backs and go, woke, woke. We've met. 